good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special Twin City Startup Week session on program-related investments in healthcare. We know that you could be in many different places right now, and you've chosen to be here with us, and that means a lot. And so we intend to make this session provocative and productive. Um, so who's presenting today? Well, uh, my name is Jeff Oakes. I'm the CEO of Venn Foundation. I'm the organizer of the session today, along with my colleague, Jan Eichler-Smith, who is managing the chat. And uh, Venn Foundation's entire mission is around mainstreaming this powerful but underutilized tool in philanthropy called Program-Related Investments, or PRIs, and we'll be diving into that more shortly. I'm very happy to be joined today by three incredible partners, uh, Ken Aduli, who is the Director of Development with Children's Cancer Research Fund, Erica Barnes, who runs the Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council, and Chris Gear, who is the Senior Technology Portfolio Manager for University of Minnesota TechCom. So here's the outline of the presentation today. I'll be kicking it off shortly with a 10 minute introduction into program related investments and to Venn Foundation. Chris will take the baton from me and will provide you with an overview of the University of Minnesota technology transfer operations. And he'll discuss a new partnership between Venn Foundation and the University of Minnesota uh, in technology transfer. And he'll share a little bit about our first PRI project or two, both of which happen to be in healthcare. And Ken will take over then and talk about uh, the Children's Cancer Research Fund and what led them to be our anchor partner for the first program-related investment pilot project in the area of osteosarcoma. And Erica will finish us off with an introduction to her work with the Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council and uh, talk a little bit about what potential PRIs hold in that space. Uh, before we begin, there's just you know a couple housekeeping notes here. We've asked the presenters to take about 10 minutes each for those sections. Some might be a little more, some might be a little less, um, but Jan is gonna be helping us keep on track with some of that. And then we have about 15 minutes of flex time for your questions and for your comments. And please feel free to ask questions or share comments in the chat as we go. Jan will be monitoring them and she might also interject with a comment or two during the session, um, or we might wait until the end uh, during the Q&A time to address your question as well. So thanks again for joining us and we'll get going. So the first uh, topic of the day, the first question is probably the most fundamental to the session. And that is just the very simple question, what is a program related investment? And I'm gonna tackle that one now. Today, we basically have two types of capital in our ecosystem. We're all familiar with these. Uh, basically, we have charitable donations in one bucket. We do uh, charitable donations to give away money, to do good things. We never expect any money back from them. In investment lingo, that would be an expected negative 100% return. And then the second bucket we have is for-profit investing, which we deploy primarily for the purpose of making as much money as possible on a risk-adjusted basis. Those are the two flavors of capital in our ecosystem today. Well, PRIs are a special capital tool that lies at the intersection of charity and investing. They are where charity and investing meet. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there just so happens to be two key requirements of a PRI, and they match this diagram pretty well. First, the primary purpose of the program-related investment must be charitable, as defined by the IRS, and that's why it's part of the charitable circle. Um, but second, it's not a grant or a donation. In fact, it's an investment, and that there has to be some potential for some type of financial return in some type of a scenario, even if the terms on, uh, under which the investment is made are below market. So just to summarize, every PRI has to meet these two tests. The first is the charitable purpose test, and the second is the below market investment test. Now, now that we have a firm grasp on what every PRI has in common, we can talk a little bit about the ways in which they can be different from each other. Um, and since we're kind of talking about PRIs as tools, we'll, I can start with an analogy that I think we all can relate to, and that is vacuum cleaners. <laughs> it's well known that uh, all vacuum cleaners use suction to clean things. That is the core trait that they all have in common. Um, but what is also well known is that they are very versatile and also very diverse. And they can take on a lot of different shapes and sizes, many different designs. They can try to do lots of different jobs in lots of different locations. So they all share that fundamental trait, but they're also very different. And it's basically the same with program-related investments. 
uh, they all share those two traits. They have to advance a charitable purpose and they have to be a below market uh, structured investment. But beyond that, there's a lot of diversity and it's very versatile. So you can use PRIs to advance any IRS charitable purpose. They can be made to any type of recipients and that can include nonprofits, governments, businesses, and individuals. And they can also be structured in any way. So you can make them as loans or equity or convertible notes, and they can be uh, made in any geographic location. So they're also very diverse as long as they share those two traits of charitable purpose and below market rate. To sort of summarize uh, program related investments, they're really meant to go where traditional for profit investors are going to say no, where they're going to give you the hand and say we're not interested and usually for good reasons based on what their goals are. Um, but program related investments want to go where uh, capital typically doesn't because there's potential for charitable impact. PRIs are a powerful tool um, for philanthropists, regardless of which type of philanthropist you might be. Um, and certainly there's nuance to this, depending on everyone's tax situation and status and stuff like that. But generally, we can bucket the advantages into three different types of advantages. The first advantage would be the tax benefits. Uh, because program-related investments are made with charitable dollars, the donor gets the same tax deductions uh, as any other charitable contribution. Plus, because PRIs are in a charitable tool, there's usually not any tax on any gains. So there's more leverage on your dollar going in and being and being reused. Um, now, the downside, if you want to think about it that way, is that you can't profit personally from that anymore because it has to stay within the charitable world from there on out. But the tax benefits are a big upside. The second is that there's only upside to the investment. The glass is always half full. And it's really just about anchoring because today when we're charitable, we never expect any money back from our charitable dollars. With that as the starting point, a PRI can only ever deliver better financial returns than we're already willing to accept from all our grants and donations. So there's a lot of upside potential with PRIs. And third, it's all really about recycling. Uh, any financial return that we get back from a PRI can be reused again and again for more impact. Again, when you consider that when we make a grant, we get to use that dollar one time for impact. When we make a 0% loan, uh, for example, that same dollar can be recycled an infinite number of times. And there's a big difference between one-time use and infinite use. And this leverage that we're talking about, even in a 0% return scenario, it even exists if you're losing some principle each time. So if we make a PRI and we lose 20 cents on our dollar and we do that over and over again, we would get uh, about five times the impact from that dollar compared to a grant. Now, we don't really have any particular infrastructure in place to facilitate below market rate investing in our society. We have grants and a lot of donations that go through. And then we also have market rate capital um, markets. And we don't really do anything with below market rate investing. And one of the questions that we ask at Venn Foundation is, what if we could look at below market capital not as silly or poor investing, but rather as smart philanthropy? Because there's a lot of opportunity and leverage that we're leaving on the table. So that is the question, uh, what are PRIs? And hopefully that gives you a, a good overview of the tool itself. Um, I'd like to go next into the second question, which is, what is Venn Foundation? And hopefully at this point, you're excited about PRIs and you think that they might have a lot of potential to do some neat things. But there just unfortunately happens to be this really big problem. And that is the market for PRIs doesn't function very well today. Um, in other words, it's really hard for any one potential PRI recipient to actually get PRI capital. Consider these four types of philanthropists, individuals and businesses. Uh, that's about 80 percent of philanthropy in a given year. They cannot legally make PRIs uh, directly, no matter how charitable an investment is, no matter how below market, and, and they cannot receive a tax deduction for that. So 80% of the philanthropic market can't use the tool directly. That leaves private foundations and donor advised funds and public charities um, who've long been legal, legally able to make PRIs, but there's a lot of practical challenges that are usually faced when they're doing that. And as a result, PRIs you know, remain incredibly underused generally. Um, we did a lot of research at Venn Foundation, and we found that in an average year out of over 1,600 Minnesota private foundations, only 11 foundations will actually make one. And the average uh, total distribution in PRIs is about $9 million out of about $1.3 billion in aggregate charitable distribution by the same category of foundations. So it's a sliver of activity, and it's all just meant to say that there isn't much of a market active for PRIs today. And it's into that context that Venn Foundation is coming into the picture. Venn Foundation just is trying to make it possible and easy for any type of donor 
to make PRIs with their charitable capital. Um, any individual or entity can create a specialized donor advised fund called a Venn account. Uh, donors retain advisory privileges over their account, and they can recommend that their donations be used for particular PRI opportunities that fit with their charitable goals. And then when returns come back to Venn Foundation, as we all hope it does, uh, it then goes back into those same donor accounts pro rata based on their initial support of that PRI position. And then the donor can recommend where that money can be redistributed again into new PRIs or to normal grants to nonprofit organizations. So it's the power of recyclability and also the ability to syndicate one PRI opportunity among different actors. Now, I'd like to share two different examples of what we call custom program related investments. That's one uh, off direct investing that we do uh, and in the area of healthcare. Uh, the first one is an example that a lot of uh, folks in this ecosystem know, uh, and it's with uh, Breed99, which is a local Twin Cities based uh, public ben benefit corporation. And uh, last year at the start of the pandemic, when PPE was in short supply, Venn Foundation syndicated a PRI to Breed99 uh, they make reusable respirators that offer industrial protection for everyday life. And we did this investment with the primary purpose of helping uh, re uh, relief the in the disaster context of COVID-19 pandemic, and also uh, with the case of some economic development. And this PRI ended up being about $130,000, which was contributed from about 10 donor accounts into a two-year 3% uh, simple interest subordinate loan. Uh, and uh, it's, it was a powerful example of uh, reacting pretty quickly to the emerging situation of the pandemic. The second example was actually our first PRI and, uh, ever, and this was with Binary Bridge, which is another local uh, startup company uh, in the area of healthcare. They're commercializing Backpack EMR, which is a rugged EMR system, uh, electronic medical record system that's specifically designed for medical missions and rural clinics in developing countries. And we closed on a program related investment of about $177,000 that was contributed from 12 donor accounts on a low interest subordinate and unsecured loan. So those just give you two different examples of uh, healthcare startups in the Twin Cities that we've been working with uh, over time uh, on this direct custom PRI activity. As a whole, Venn Foundation is about three and a half years into our uh, transaction work, and we've been doing pretty well. We are at about 72 accounts across all those types of philanthropists that we've talked about. We've uh, Those philanthropists have contributed about $6.6 .6 million into those accounts. Venn Foundation has deployed over 5 million of that uh, amount of money into 19 PRIs. So we're definitely past this sort of proof of concept phase, and we're now entering what we would call our early growth phase. And sort of my last thing that I want to mention in this section is that it's not just Venn Foundation doing PRIs in the area of healthcare. Um, there's many other examples and leaders out there doing this. And I think the, the most important one to really honor is the, uh, the Gates Foundation. They have been putting hundreds of millions of dollars into program related investments in the healthcare space over the last decade. And I would love to encourage you to go onto their website and actually read about their entire PRI, PRI portfolio. Um, they've got basically profiles on each of them. And I've just pulled out three really interesting examples that show the diversity of how PRIs can be used by sophisticated players in the field of healthcare. And in particular, these three that I've highlighted are within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so you see uh, both governmental uh, agencies or uh, sort of quasi-governmental agencies, as well as a traditional business, uh, a large established corporation in Abbott, and then a, a more startup-based uh, uh uh, biotech company that was working with mRNA vaccines at the, uh, in 2015, this investment happened. And these are equity PRIs. Some of them are guarantees. Some of them are debt. So it just kind of gives you a sense of how a very sophisticated partner has been using this in the healthcare space as well. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Chris Gear to talk a bit about technology transfer. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, first, I want to say I, I like the Breed99 example. Our family has two of those. So very appreciative of that. Um, so my name is Chris Gear. I work at the University of Minnesota. I work in the office. It's called the Technology Commercialization Office. And uh, Jeff, you want to jump to the next slide? The Technology Commercialization Office sits in between the researchers, which um, have the new inventions, and the market, the businesses, and tries to create partnerships between the University of Minnesota and businesses. And it may be a startup company, um, which you hear a lot of, which uh, gets talked about as our venture center. Um, or it might be a license agreement with Medtronic or something or, or a larger player like that. Our goal is to get those products out into the market so that they can do public good, 
create economic growth, and then potentially generate revenue for the University of Minnesota. Next slide. And one of the challenges we run into frequently, I'd say probably on roughly 60 to 65% of our portfolio is that there is a huge gap between when something is discovered and when the market thinks it is de-risked enough for them to take a license to it and start investing money in it. So um, I'll use Medtronic again as an example. Medtronic isn't going to invest money in the FDA until the science has been de-risked to the point where their ROI calculation works. This is the commercializ commercialization gap, and this is why um, we have partnered with Venn to try to bring in this PRI, use this PRI tool to bring in capital into this phase of the innovation cycle. A quick, next slide, a quick couple examples of kind of large impact healthcare discoveries. Ziogen uh, was developed at this point probably 15, no, probably 20 plus years ago at the University of Minnesota. It is a daily drug taken by HIV AIDS patients. And, um, in widely impacts the world. Uh, it also brought in hundreds of millions of dollars to the University of Minnesota over the last 20 years. Um, at this point, it is off patent and, and off and as it being sold as a generic, but still a great impact of the University of Minnesota out there. The next one on the list that I pulled up is Mirror Matrix. And many people in Twin City startup community know Mirror Matrix just because they IPO'd three months ago. So, um, Miro Matrix started at the University of Minnesota. It is a mechanism for, um, it is a process that decellularizes organs and allows them to be transplanted into you and your body adopt them as if it was your own organ. And, um, and they're doing outstanding. Um, they're gonna take lots of uh, investment to get them to a product of where I believe this is a kidney or liver. I'm not a biologist. Anyway, um, the, uh, but where they can put organs like that inside person, but um, they're on their way and they probably have five to six years left, I believe in their product cycle until they're doing this type of thing, if I'm recalling that correctly. Uh, the next technology that was a major kind of impact in healthcare, this is actually, it's called the Sleeping Beauty technology. Um, and it is a gene delivery technology focused on blood-based children's cancers. And actually, um, I had an email exchange with Kenna, who's gonna speak next, that CCRF, Children's Cancer Research Fund, actually had a little bit of funding into this project years ago. So kind of interesting tidbit here. But the reason why this one is, is so um, crucial to this conversation is actually, if we jump to the next slide, that technology took 18 years before we found a commercial partner to um, pair with it. So if you think about it, the invention happened at the University of Minnesota. 18 years later, we've, we find it has finally been de-risked to a point where there's a commercial partner that is at the table working on it. This is actually not abnormal. Um, some, some technologies can be licensed right away in the first year, and some take progressively take longer and longer. And this is a high-risk time where um, universities leave innovative technologies behind because they are an expense and they're not moving forward. And we see PRIs as a good opportunity in this area to try to build funding. Um, this actually leads to, next slide, um, only four out of 100 technologies that dis get disclosed to tech transfer offices turn into products. So if you think about the innovation ecosystem in universities, that's a really, small number that actually make it. And from my perspective, and I'm gonna give two examples of the, of the work we're doing with Venn, um, one of the things that Venn is able to bring to the table is also allow it so that they, their charitable donation is making it so the University of Minnesota is fo focusing on the, that technology. Um, our office has 400 technologies we manage a year. Um, like every university, we're understaffed we, we have to prioritize where we can. Uh, we tend to go where the fires are. And mechanisms like this really make it so that it focuses our attention on what is both something that can make it to the market 
and is something that can take a crucial step forward. So this is um, this is similar to the slide probably like five back where I was describing this commercialization gap, but this is just a little bit more detailed. Um, the University of Minnesota has significant funding in basic research. We get most of that from NIH and NSF. And, um, and then when we create a partnership, there's significant money available in product development and marketing and sales. But this gap in the middle, there is very little money available to these projects. So we see this tool as a potential here. Um, this is, so this is, this is kind of detailing the partnership. Um, ultimately what the partnership is, is similar to what Jeff was talking about. Um, money can come in through the Venn Foundation, um, go into the University of Minnesota, and can be used for a project that fits the mission of your organization. But one of the things I think is really interesting about this is, is how simple some of the problems that technology transfer hits as it is trying to transfer technology. And I have examples down there. Not all of these are big problems. Some of these are $10,000 problems. Some of them are, um, we're gonna go through a couple later that are $300,000 problems. But these ones, some of these ones um, are, are $5,000, $10,000 problems that if, if someone wants to come in and help solve that for a specific technology, it, it will help. So the partnership between Venn Foundation and TechCom focuses on technologies that the University of Minnesota hasn't licensed and ones that we can identify a milestone that we think would attract a commercial partner. So if we can hit a milestone, then we can do that. Um, the, the partnership is, is primarily built on a master agreement. So we have the agreement in place between the University of Minnesota and the Venn Foundation that if there's a project you wanna fund, the money can flow through that master agreement and can fund one or multiple projects. And in return, um, the as Jeff was talking about earlier, the ROI is uh, if you put in $100,000 and we, we, the University of Minnesota, successfully license it, then you can get up to three times your grant back. So $300,000 could come back to your organization if the University of Minnesota is successful in licensing that technology to a business. So the first example I'm gonna go through and it'll lead into um, Kenna is, is the osteosarcoma project, which um, CCRF and Chloe's fight funded, but um, it is a team, Jeff, you want to jump to the next one. Um, it is three years and is the goal of developing a cancer blood diagnostic um, by doing two paths. One, advancing the science to a point where company might be interested in taking it. This is a rare disease, very small market. Um, this has to be de-risked to a point where a company can come in and not have to take it through the FDA, not have to take all that regulatory burden for us to be able to transfer this technology. So we need, um, we, the University of Minnesota, needs to step this forward much further than we would a multi-billion dollar market. Um, and in doing so, we've had to enlist a bunch of experts to help us with the regulatory path, the reimbursement path, and really the market and under, understanding and business development. We have, um, I actually go back. Uh, uh, so Jaime Modiano is the PI on this, but Kelly on the far right side actually joined us for this presentation. So I see her in the crowd. Um, so, um, and then the next project we have uh, is a male contraceptive funded by Venn and the Male Contraceptive uh, Institute. It is a 12 month project and it is focused on finding the right uh, oral compound for male contraception. And that is also going very well. Um, I think we're gonna focus more based on the panel on the osteosarcoma project. Uh, but those are the two pilots we have going through the Venn Foundation Master Agreement. With that, I'll step back and hand it off to Kenna. Thank you, Chris. And thanks, Jeff, also for uh, inviting me to this panel. And I just want to spend the first uh, probably two minutes describing Children's Cancer Research Fund, um, the organization for which I am Director of Development and Donor Relations. 
and really highlight two points that make me very proud to work on behalf of this organization. The first being that over 40 years now, CCRF has provided $213 million in funding for pediatric cancer research, um, as well as some family programs and awareness of the problem of childhood cancer, um, but primarily research. And um, also very important in our last fiscal year, as is the case in uh, most fiscal years, 85% of our donations went toward research, education and quality of life programs. Um, so we're very proud to present that statistic to our donors and ensure that um, their contributions are going directly to mission. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our why. More adults than kids get cancer and that's why governments and foundations fund more research for adult cancers. Um, but that's not okay with us. Only 4% of federal cancer research funding is dedicated to childhood cancer. Um, we fund research nationwide. We have a strong partnership with the University of Minnesota, um, but we fund research nationwide now. And, and many organizations fund research at just one hospital or one university. We fund research across the country. And that's really based on where we can make the greatest impact and find the best science. So we've funded more than 170 researchers at 22 different research institutions now in our 40th year. And we help our donors dollar go 18 times further. We focus on providing seed grants really um, that allow researchers to prove their idea and then reach for even larger grants, a lot of what Chris talked about there. So that model is why on average for every $1 that a donor invests in CCRF, we are able to help scientists secure an additional $18 in research funding. Next slide, please. Um, our unique approach to funding research and support programs makes us an organization where all donations, whether big or small, will stretch as far as possible. But to ensure this, we really focus our funding. Um, I'll dig into the hard to treat diseases, but just a really quick snapshot of each emerging scientist. So we focus on young researchers with fresh, ambitious ideas. Um, you know, federal funding is not available to those researchers until they've done enough research and gathered the data pr to prove that something is worth um, carrying forward. And many other funding sources don't fund research projects until later in the process. So that's really a niche area where CCRF um, steps in and helps remove roadblocks for young researchers. Hard to treat cancers, that's the project we'll dig into. But um, you know, cancers where survival rates remain low or treatments haven't improved in decades, um, that also sets us apart that, you know, we, we're going to go where other funders right now aren't going. Um, and then survivorship. So when CSRF was founded 40 years ago, six out of 10 children diagnosed with cancer would survive. Today, uh, CSRF has played a large part in helping bring that rate of survivorship to over 80%. That said, nearly all childhood cancer survivors will have a significant health-related issue by the time they're 45. So today's therapies, even though some of them have improved significantly, they still cause late effects and even secondary cancers. So our research aims to prevent late effects from ever happening. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna hone in on osteosarcoma here because um, that's where we were targeting our, our first program related investment. Osteosarcoma OS falls into our hard to treat cancer category. Um, I was reading through and in one blog post, CCRF wrote that OS had been around since the dinosaurs. And while treatments for OS aren't quite that old, most of them haven't changed since the eighties. So, you know, most of them are as old as the movie E.T. or the first Pac-Man video, which you know, kids today probably aren't even familiar with. Um, and then on top of that, even successful treatments uh, only cure 70% of the time. So for the other 30% of patients, the disease takes over. And if that's not bad enough news, even successful treatment for OS causes harsh side effects and significant damage to growing bodies. Next slide, please. So pictured here is Mariah, who's an ambassador for CCRF. She's an OS survivor uh, who, as you can see in this slide, underwent an amputation of her leg and nine months of chemotherapy after her diagnosis, which was at age two. Mariah is now a thriving young woman. Um, she's actually now working in the U of M's 
um, bone and marrow transplant and brain cancer research labs. But her story is just one that illustrates the need for better treatments for kids with osteosarcoma. And that brings us to the next slide, which is our pilot PRI with Venn Foundation. So our pilot PRI was a syndication of CCRF, um, and we were supported in part by a funder out of South Florida called the Childhood Cancer Project. And um, then we joined Chloe's fight in this um, PRI. We saw a lot of promise in Dr. Modiano's research that Chris had um, alluded to there to develop a diagnostic test for osteosarcoma. So essentially to see how bad a child's cancer was and then treat it accordingly. So if we can avoid aggressive treatment and the devastating side effects because a particular child's cancer doesn't warrant that aggressive of treatment, then we should do that. Um, so CCRF invested about $300,000 in the project through this PRI. We established our VEN account and made that investment. And we do stand to receive up to 3x returns if that technology is licensed. Um, so this slide really illustrates how PRIs are aligned to both impact return and financial return. We don't just fund research for the sake of research. We want to get promising research out to real patients and help in that commercialization gap. Um, so using PRAs for this purpose, you know, we, we do a lot of just traditional normal granting, and this is a space that we're um, newly getting into, but we know that it has the potential to return revenue to our organization, which we will then reinvest uh, for more impact gains. So, you know, double bottom line, win-win returns, and we're super excited about this potential and so are our donors. Great. So thank you, Chris, Kenna, Jeff, for uh, explaining PRIs and how they're being deployed right now. Um, some um, really concrete examples of ways that PRIs are already making an impact. And I want to take kind of close out this panel with uh, looking forward, doing a little forward looking and having a visionary conversation around the potential for PRIs to be applied to a patient population that historically has been underfunded and overlooked in medicine, and that's the rare disease community. Um, so I'll start with sharing a little bit about my story because it's so illustrative of so many rare disease patients. So this is my daughter, Chloe. She was born in 2008. And when Chloe was born, there was no indication uh, that anything was wrong with her. She had a clean bill of health on the newborn screening uh, and um, well, well child checkups, nothing, nothing wrong. Um, but around 14 months of age, she started to show some really troubling signs and symptoms. Um, I work in healthcare. I was working in a hospital at the time, and I was starting to notice some really troubling signs and symptoms. So um, eventually, my daughter, through a very frustrating, uh, very long process, was diagnosed with a rare disease, a rare neuro neurodegenerative disease called metachromatic leukodystrophy. And um, once she was diagnosed, uh, we uh, were made aware of the fact that there was really no effective treatment at that time for metachromatic leukodystrophy. And the only option available to her was a bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, bone marrow transplants, um, while they're very effective in some patient populations, they're not highly effective for metachromatic leukodystrophy, and there's a high risk of mortality. So Chloe passed away uh, from the complications of the bone marrow transplant. And um, after she passed away, um, I got involved in uh, raising awareness and working toward a treatment, and it was in this advocacy work that I became aware of the term uh, medical orphan, orphan uh, diseases, and what that means is anytime an individual is diagnosed with a rare disease, they become a medical orphan, and, and the reason that, that that term was coined was rare diseases typically are not well understood and not well um, addressed by the medical community. Um, you can see the little zebra on this slide. Um, there's an adage in medicine um, that a lot of medical professionals tell me they learned in medical school that is, uh, when you hear hoofbeats, look for horses and not zebras. And that's the way to say, really stay focused on common diseases, don't get sidetracked by rare diseases. Um, unfortunately, uh, when you have a little zebra, um, that, that phrase is not, not, not a super great one to hear. Um, so next slide. So because of this issue, um, I began working in 2018 with a great group of stakeholders 
um, other rare disease patients, rare disease patient um, advocates, uh, doctors, uh, hospital systems, medical associations, and we advocated for the creation of a rare disease advisory council here in the state of Minnesota. And the animus for, for that was really a recognition and it was rooted in the fact that we understood that while there are over 7,000 rare diseases and they affect one in 10 of the general population, we are um, historically not well understood by medicine. So the bill passed in 2019 and the advisory council was housed in the University of Minnesota Medical School. Uh, we have a great uh, membership. It's chaired by the Dean of the Medical School, Dr. Jacob Tolar. And the mission is to provide advice on research, diagnosis, treatment, and education related to rare diseases. And our overall vision is to improve care for um, all Minnesotans that are living with a rare disease. Uh, next slide. So the council executes its mission around four separate pillars, um, and they're kind of our core, core um, initiatives that we want to address. And the uh, you can look at these. The first one is increasing our understanding of the rare disease community, uh, even basic knowledge of prevalence and um, um, other just basic um, knowledge, the natural history of a disease are not always well understood. So we want to increase our knowledge, our baseline knowledge. Um, we want to improve coordination of care, reduce time to diagnosis. The average time to diagnosis for a rare disease patient is seven to eight years. Um, and then that last pillar is the acceleration of research. And that's the one I'm going to really hone in on now for the rest of my talk. So next slide. So the reason that the council focuses on the acceleration of research is really well articulated in this New Yorker cartoon. And I know it's supposed to be lighthearted, but if you look at this cartoon, it shows a doctor and a despondent patient and the doctor saying, unfortunately, there's no cure. There's not even a race for a cure. Um, and while this is kind of lighthearted, it is the experience of a vast majority of rare disease patients um, when, they, when they engage with the medical community. And the reason for that is that only roughly 5% of the 7,000 rare disease patient populations have an FDA approved treatment. Uh, that's not even a cure, that's just a treatment. So the vast majority of rare disease patients find themselves in a situation that after a very uh, traumatic and arduous hunt for a diagnosis, um, the way I always say it is we woke up from the nightmare of not having a diagnosis to the nightmare of not having a treatment for our daughter. So that is the situation of, of most rare disease communities. Uh, next slide. And there are a number of reasons for that. But before I jump into those reasons, I want to talk a little bit about the juxtaposition of uh, um, current state of research and um, the funding situation. So the current state of medicine for rare diseases is actually very promising and very exciting. Um, and the reason for that is there's been a lot of breakthrough um, treatments that, that are transforming care. Um, most of those we find in gene editing. So I know Chris mentioned Sleeping Beauty um, and the, the you know, 18 years of, of taking Sleeping Beauty um, and um, that was Sleeping Beauty. It's complicated, but it's it's part of the whole gene therapy evolution and the, the really uh, ascendancy of breakthroughs and advancements for gene editing and gene therapy. I'm sure um, most, if not all of you on this um, uh, um panel and in this talk have seen some of the headlines. So we're really seeing gene therapy and CRISPR gene editing revolutionize care. Um, and it's specifically, rare diseases are specifically amenable to this technology because about 80% of all rare diseases have a genetic component and a genetic basis. Many of them are monogenic. So gene therapy holds the promise of taking diseases that historically were out of the reach of medicine and bringing them into the ability to uh, I will be so bold as to say curative, they can be curative. Um, obviously the field is nascent right now, but um, they show every, every indication of being able to cure some of these diseases. Next slide. But unfortunately for every headline that we see about breakthrough treatments, we see headlines like this one. Um, so this is a headline that talks about a family who's raising millions of dollars to fund treatment for their child uh, for a genetic disorder that their child has. Um, when you read these stories of these families, um, um, most likely what the case is, is that there's, there's kind of two components and two elements to these stories. One, as you can see, you see that the onus is often on these families themselves to raise millions of dollars um, and or small nonprofits that are usually started by families that are 
trying to raise millions of dollars to either cure their own child's disease or um, other children. The other element that you often see in these stories is that these parents and these families are investing in research at the basic science level in, in academia. And as you heard from Chris's talk, um, that is absolutely important, but there's a big pipeline, right? And there's a lot of investment that needs to happen further down that pipeline, more toward the commercialization space. And you just don't see a lot of families um, and a lot of small rare disease foundations investing in that space for a number of reasons, uh, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So next slide. Um, so what are some of the challenges that are contributing to this phenomenon of seeing that while there are breakthrough treatments on the horizon, there is a lot of funding going on by families um, and we, we just have some economic challenges. The first one being the most obvious to everyone and that's that rare diseases by definition have smaller patient populations. So that represents smaller markets. Um, so investors and um, companies that are trying to recoup the, the uh, cost of their um, drug development and research um, they have smaller patient populations uh, in smaller markets to work with. So that can make it not as attractive. Another thing that can make it very challenging to invest is the absence of some baseline data. And then some of these diseases are very complex. So that can make it seem very high risk to companies to invest in these uh, rare disease treatments because it's, it's just more complex and it's not as accepted. There's not the body of knowledge as there is in something like diabetes. Um, and then we see that the absence of, in the absence of venture capital, fundraising is really driven by these small nonprofits or the families. And again, as I mentioned before, um, it's been my observation that, that the, the center of gravity pulls toward that basic science in part because a lot of times these families are going to invest in the researcher that helped them. And so there's just a lot of investment at that end of the pipeline. So these challenges mean that many rare diseases are, are being overlooked by for-profit investors for good reason, like Jeff mentioned before. If your business model is that you're looking for the biggest return on investment that you can get and maximizing the profits of your investors, these diseases aren't going to be as attractive. Um, the other um, consequence that often that we see that often happens is that in order to meet those return on investment expectations, these drugs can be priced very high. Uh, that can lead to some access issues. It can cause, um, you know, reimbursement and payers to bulk. So, so there's really some some serious economic challenges to investing in the rare disease space. So, next slide. So it's obvious that in the rare disease space, if we're talking about taking that five percent number and increasing it so that so that all those patient populations, rare disease patient populations, can get a treatment, there's going to be there's a need for some innovation. And one of the big needs and what's so excited, exciting to me about PRIs is there's an urgent need for innovation in the way we raise capital. Um, and when I heard about PRIs and I heard about Jeff, uh, it, it's so closely matched. So the solution, the PRI solution matches so closely in my mind to the problem. So if you think about what the problem is and what kind of capital we need, we need, we need capital that's motivated primarily by a charitable impact. So, um, it's a huge equity issue in my mind that these children that are born with the, these diseases are devastating, um, and it's for for a rare for the rare disease population for such a large patient population in healthcare to have such low treatment options. Um, I think we need to think of that in terms of equity. These patients deserve a treatment, um, but also this capital is going to need to be able to accept below market returns. There's just small patient populations and. And um, in the absence of pricing them sky high um, to where it creates access problems, if we could find capital that would accept those below market returns, that would keep access um, better. And that would also help us invest in more diseases. Uh, another benefit of PRIs or capital innovation is that it would allow some of these philanthropic donors to support commercial, the commercialization process. Right now, you know, these these small nonprofits are really donating where they, they can give philanthropic dollars. Um, but having a PRI and sort of blending um, blending the blend that PRIs um, represent would allow some of these philanthropic donors to invest in the commercialization process to get this basic science to the bedside and actually to commercial treatments. Uh, next slide. 
So I want to leave you all with um, a quote that a friend of mine just said recently, and it, it, it really just hit home to me, the, the urgency and the challenge of developing drugs and developing commercially available treatments. So my friend Maria, who also is an advocate, uh, she told me the other day, we used to lose our children because society couldn't figure out how to cure them. Now we're losing our children because society can't figure out how to pay for it. So we're seeing revol revolutionary treatments. We're seeing revolutionary advances in medicine. And I think we need to see some revolution in our economics of drug development and research. Thank you. My thanks to uh, all the panelists uh, for just doing an excellent job of uh, bringing your perspective to the discussion. Um, Jan, I know that uh, you've been looking at the chat. Have there been any questions that folks have uh, brought up or do you have any as you're observing the conversation? Well, I have a whole host of questions, tackle? so I'll just kind of start at the top of the list and we'll see how long we can go. Um, one of the things that really struck me as uh, you all spoke was, um, and this is my word, not a word any of you used, but the overwhelming difficult task of selecting where to spend your financial resources and your time, whether it be on research, whether it be on a, a, a technology that's hard, you know, something physical, whatever it might be. And I, I, I think it would be helpful for some of the startups who may be considering starting an enterprise that is in these difficult gap areas, if they had a better understanding of how do you go about um, making those tough choices. And yeah, I guess I should pick somebody to go first. So we'll just go in the order that you spoke. So Chris, why don't you start, please? That is a hard question. Um, so so I could I can answer it a couple different ways. Um, one would be how the University of Minnesota approaches kind of technology commercialization as a whole. Um, we we do have a dual mission of impact and financial return to the institution. Uh, oftentimes there's market signals that we can say this is something that's pulling this. This seems like a big deal. We also see um, our researchers' publications and we start seeing what's getting more attention. Um, if we look at it from the PRI perspective, uh, one of the most challenging things I would say is finding the right technology for the right funder and doing that pairing. And what worked out really well when uh, for this initial pilot was that um, CCRF came to the table with their priorities and they knew what, what they wanted to fund because for, for me to find within the university the right, um, uh, the right researcher, it may not align. And, and so I think to both Kenna and Erica's conversations, um, you're able to guide your money into focus on an innovation that fits your mission, fits your rare disease, fits in, in a way that um, I, I don't have any other funding mechanisms that work like that, at least through tech commercialization. So I think that um, that technology funder pairing is hard, but it's actually in the funder's benefit to drive that priority. Yeah, the way that I would answer that, and it's an interesting, I mean, the timing is interesting for a Children's Cancer Research Fund as we're in the midst of strategic planning and creating a vision for the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. But some questions that we um, continually ask ourselves are, you know, where is there an unmet need? I guess I feel fortunate that we we aren't looking for financial returns. Um, this this program related investment was really a perfect marriage of where we saw an unmet need and a project that, you know, Chris came to CCRF along with, with Jeff and said, we do see a potential for financial returns here, which just means that we get to reinvest. But typically, you know, we're not looking for a sure bet. We're trying to meet a need that, you know, nobody else is paying attention to perhaps. Um, so there are a lack of other funders in the space. One caveat there I would say is we do sometimes look for synergies. So maybe there are other organizations that are paying attention to something. And we know that if we collaborate, um, just that power of collaboration can produce an effect and impact that we couldn't do on our own. Um, 
But really, the other thing I want to point out is it's it's often our donor's passion that steers us in a particular direction, which we do need to be um, cautious about. To Erica's to Erica's point earlier, but I think of um, you know the Sobiec, the Zach Sobiec family, and the passion that they had after Zach's passing to make a difference for kids with osteosarcoma. And CCRF, you know, along with the Sobiacs are, you know, really driven by the Sobiacs in some ways. We built something there that we can now continue to build upon. Well, I already feel like Kenna and Chris have used all the words that are music to my ears, the <laughs> unmet need, um, collaboration. And, and I really love Chris's point about relationship. You know, and I see PRIs as a great way to allow a relationship between a donor and a project that they feel passionate about. I would add in terms of rare diseases, just as um, kind of a kind of a really interesting point that um, what's exciting in the rare disease space is there's a lot of platform technologies um, now that are on the ascendancy where you invest in one type of technology and that has potential to really generalize to many, many rare diseases. So there's a real um, opportunity to approach research in a new way, even with these platform technologies, um, to really huge bang for your buck, right? And, and not just um, in silos say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna affect this one disease, but there's a lot of platform technology. So there's a tremendous opportunity in terms of um, what an interested donor could do to make a large impact in the rare disease community. Erica, can I can I layer on to to your that last comment? But then in your in your presentation, you talked about ROI, and I think one of the things that's really interesting about this osteosarcoma project is so you know, I Jeff and I actually had the same MBA. We were in the same MBA program, but I, I can tell you we did a lot of work on the ROI calculation and and how to get the return on investment, and the charitable dollars coming in changes that calculation. Just right. fundamentally, it, it takes money out so that a company can invest less money and then have a higher ROI. So to, to your point about just, you may never have an ROI. Uh, the charitable contribution may just have to come in to the denominator to make that number low enough to make it so that a company does look at it and says that it has an ROI. And, and I think that is spot on why this is a unique and um, powerful tool. Thank you. Thank you all. Jeff, can I sneak in one more? Please, yes. <laughs> so uh, for folks who are listening who may not be familiar with PRIs, uh, and we'll go in reverse order this time, Erica, if you guys could give me a sense of what you found surprisingly easy about the PRI and what may have surprised you um, as uh, either a frustration point or you thought it would solve a particular problem that it didn't solve, that, that, that whether it would be the, the enterprise that was receiving the funding still had a particular struggle, whatever it might be, just so that folks who are thinking of maybe pursuing this or investing in this understand sort of the, uh, the joys and the valleys you all have maybe experienced as well. So thanks, Erica. Sure. So I think the, I don't know if it, the it's surprising would be the word, but I think one of the really neat values of the PRI that we found so, so great uh, is kind of the collaboration with other donors, you know, really being able to, to get to know CCRF and their mission and their vision and sort of that sense of collaboration is just really exciting. Um, I think we're all wired for community. Um, I think, you know, as a, as a, as a, just a level set for expectations, you know, PRIs are great, but it still requires patience, right? Like you, you kind of think you get out, you get revved up and you're like, okay, we're going to, we're going to, you know, have a cure tomorrow. I mean, like anything, right? It's a tool and you still have to pace yourself and understand that, that science is, still takes time and, and you have to be in it for the long game. Um, so there's, there's still that process. So, um, just a, a remind, you know, reminding ourselves that even with innovation, it still takes time uh, to move fields forward. Thank you. Uh, I concur. I guess I my the value and and really benefit that CCRF experienced was the ease. Um, you know, we were sort of privy because we were 
um, a pilot project. We were privy to the goings on of the master's agreement, be, master agreement being set up and all of that. And I know that that was um, laborious. And yet once that was set up, um, it, it was just plug and play for CCRF. I mean, truly, when, when you describe the Venn account, that, that's what it is. You know, you, you make your deposit into the account. Um, so simple, straightforward, um, you know, sort of con customer friendly. And then to echo what Erica says, um, you know, and this is not a, a new learning for me or for CCRF, but the pace you know, you you do, you make the deposit into the account and then you want to see action. And it's just this reminder that that's not how medical, you know, how research works and how science works. Um, so I don't expect that we will solve for that. It's more so, uh, you know, sort of revising expectations. We'll move as quickly as we can, but uh, we'll be understanding. Yeah. I'll bridge on Kenneth's comment. So I, I was gonna answer the second project was the easier because um, the first one took a really long time to establish what that relationship is. So uh, thanks to Chloe's Fight and CCRF for helping us pilot that first one because honestly, the second project was easier and, um, and it did feel like a template, so thank you. Um, I think the thing that was really um, beneficial, I think that was the other question you had was, the current product we have in osteosarcoma actually had some early um, money that went towards regulatory consulting. And, and we pulled in two, two regulatory experts and then a, a third consultant who has regulatory experience. And, and they gave us a regulatory path that actually changed the science. So um, our researchers it is impacting the, the early studies of the science. And this is a, this is some, something that the University of Minnesota doesn't normally do. Normally it will it'll do the science for the academic publication and then a company will go out and do the science for the regulatory filing. But our, our conversations with these regulatory experts showed us that if we made some changes early on to that early animal data, that we might cut years off of the product life in getting to market. So, um, so actually our research team is currently doing that. They're, they put a pause and they haven't kicked off some of the animal studies until they can have this regulatory um, meeting. But from my perspective, that is a huge value, um, both from the structure of this grant, but then also, um, I mean, if it's three years, if it's six years, whatever that, whatever they cut that down to the market, it seems sizable from my understanding. Thank you. I want to express uh, my gratitude to the panelists for joining uh, joining us today, but even more broadly for being partners in this work and helping to pioneer this the use of this tool, in particular uh, in, with healthcare uh, type missions that are really important to each of your organizations. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to just end on kind of one slide, which is uh, the key takeaways for the day. Um, I'll just kind of run through these. PRIs are a powerful capital tool for healthcare startups and funders, and we hope that you will consider it if you find yourself in one of those categories for how could this tool help you and be applicable to whatever it is you're working on. Uh, PRIs are best suited when for-profit capital isn't ready or willing to play on the terms that are needed. So think about where is capital behaving, where do you need capital to behave differently than it currently does? Um, that can often be an indicator for where PRIs can be helpful. Uh, third is this a reminder generally that PRIs have to be advancing an IRS charitable purpose, and that's easy to put in a bullet point. It's hard to sometimes know if that's applying to you. Uh, and that's one of the things about PRIs, especially with businesses, uh, if you're a business entity, that you have to kind of ask us about and we'd be happy to kind of talk about. But it does need to be uh, advancing that charitable purpose. Um, number four is, is just a general announcement here that any type or group of donors can make a PRI underneath that kind of master agreement to help any technology at the University of Minnesota that they might be passionate about and help that technology get out of the laboratory and get to license and hopefully then to the market, uh, whether that's a patient that it's trying to impact, whether it's climate science, whatever your passion area is, it's a potential uh, that we could use this model. And so if you have any interest, please reach out, uh, ask us about, uh, as Chris mentioned, there's a matchmaking process. So tell us what you're excited about and we can see if there's something that might fit. And then the final thing is just, you know, please reach out to Venn and also to any of these partners. If you want to discuss any uh, potential PRI syndications or passion areas of yours, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, with that, uh, I'm ready to adjourn this meeting. And I want to thank everyone for joining us again. And thank you as the audience for, for tuning in as well. Thank you.